One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Are you recording? Uh, yes, I'm recording, yeah. Okay, so I think we can start, right? So, um, yeah, before I start, I need to make a disclaimer because I assumed that uh, all of you who came here are rather of physics background rather than algebraic topology. So then, okay, and we are? Material science, okay, very good. Okay. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do is we'll uh, discuss uh, how to show uh, the contextuality phenomenon. So let me just start with saying a couple of words about it. So uh, contextuality is uh, something which distinguishes uh, quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. And um, well, it is more or less saying that if we are doing measures, measurements, uh, we don't uh, reveal any kind of pre-existing um, yeah, pre entity. So for example, if I'm going to weigh, my, weigh myself, right? Then it doesn't really matter uh, how good or bad device I have, my weight is something well-defined, okay? And the same for the height. But if I were uh, a, quantum, uh, a quantum entity, I would, it would be possible then if I firstly weigh myself and then I measure my height, I might get different uh, measurements rather than if I start with measuring my height and uh, measuring my weight. I hope this is more or less uh, good heuristics for thinking what contextuality is. And it is more or less saying that um, the measurement, the um, outcome of a measurement depends on the context of measurements uh, which we are choosing. And it is on the can, uh, kind of fundamental level. It, doesn't, it is not really because of um, we have not uh, perfect devices for measurements. Rather, this is something which is on the fundamental level of quantum mechanics, so we cannot really dispose of it. And uh, contextuality is also believed to be one of uh, the resources for, for a quantum speedup. Okay, uh, so one of the first and um, uh, most important example of uh, proofs of uh, quantum contextuality is the following. So this is called Mermin square. So um, let me just write the setup. So we have a um, four-dimensional complex space as our Hilbert space. This will be representing um, two qubits. Uh, and then we have these poly uh, observables, which goes like this. Okay, and now we are drawing a square of the following form. Okay, x1, x2, xx, x. z1, z2, zz. Oh, sorry, I have two here, one here, and here I have xz, zx, and y, y. Okay, uh, so x1, actually, so this is just a notation. This is x. So the uh, observable x acts on the first uh, two variables, 
right, on the first two dimensions. So then I'm tensoring it with identity on the remaining two dimensions. Uh, so in other words, I'm acting by x on the first qubit. Here, uh, x2 is um, acting by x on the second qubit, uh, and xx is x tensor x. OK? Um, so in this square, every row and every column represents a context. Which means that in every row and every column, the observables commute. Yep. OK. Uh, where is the erase? Second? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a riser. So in every row and every column. the um, uh, observables pairwise commute. OK, and this means that uh, they form a context. Now, uh, other property of the Mermin square is that in every row uh, and every column, the observables uh, multiply to one. So if we take a product of three observables in every uh, row or every column, we actually get either identity or minus identity. Okay. Um, so let's say product of every context is plus or minus identity. Actually, uh, it is identity only in it is minus identity only in one case, and this is uh, let's say crucial uh, part of the of this proof. So it is identity over here, 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 and here. And over here, it is minus identity. Now, uh, what I was saying at the beginning about, sorry, because I'm moving uh, here and there. What I was saying uh, in the beginning about contextuality, uh, what does it mean that there is no pre-existing entity which we are revealing by measurements? Well, this means that we can define a function which will assign a value uh, to every of these uh, measurements in the square. So assume that there exists a function exists S, uh, well, I don't know how to, let, let me denote it by O, and O here will be set of observables in the Mermi square. Going to Z2, in such a way that S of um, every O is equal to minus one to, uh, no, sorry. Uh, so what I want to say is that, 
yeah, so that we just uh, assign to every O minus 1 to the power S of O. So this is the definition of our function um, S. Now, once we, once we assume that uh, such a function exists, we can start to write a couple of equations. For example, from the first row, what we will get is that S of x1 plus S of x2 plus S of xx is equal to uh, is equal to 0, mod 2. Well, this is just uh, because we know that these uh, three uh, observables commute and they multiply to identity, right? Similarly, we can write, for example, S uh, of x1 plus S of z2 plus S of xz is equal to 0, mod 2. And if we go uh, through all of the rows and columns, uh, we'll write nine of equations when the last one will be S of xx plus S of zz plus S of yy is equal to 1. Modulo 2. Now, if we sum these equations, what we will actually get is that 0 is equal to 1. Well, if we just take a look, every uh, every observable here will appear in exactly two equations, right? And since we are summing modulo 2, we'll get 0 on the left-hand side, and there is only one uh, column which multiplies to minus identity, so we'll get only 1, 1 on the right-hand side. So we got that 0 is equal to 1, so we get a contradiction. And the contradiction comes from the fact that we made this assumption. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, Mermin square and proof of uh, contextuality uh, by the Mermin square. Now let's uh, think about it topologically. So uh, I will start to use this picture over here and it will remain as a, a kind of uh, main example. So how we are uh, going to use, uh, use this picture is we will uh, label the edges by uh, let me check by the observables in the Mermin square in such a way that every triangle will correspond to a context. Okay. Oh, here we have Z, X, X, Z, and here we have Y, Y. So, um, if I labeled uh, these edges over here by the same variable, this means that if we think about them geometrically, we glue them. So what we get is a torus, so a surface which looks like this. It's not really important for us, but... So this is what we get um, after gluing the edges with the uh, same label. Okay. Now, once again, uh, let us assume that there exists uh, S as before. And uh, define, a fu define a function beta. which will be doing the following thing. So uh, let me call maybe this surface S. So 
beta is going from the set of triangles in S to Z2. Right, so we are just taking it in a very naive way. We are taking a triangle and then we are assigning a, a, some value in Z2 uh, to this triangle in a following way that beta of the triangle is equal to, um, well, the S on the edge of this triangle, which means that S of A plus S of B plus S of C, where A, C, B, and C are edges of this triangle. So what we are doing is, this is our triangle T, and here we have A, B, and C, okay? For example, if we um, take a look on the triangle like this, um, for example, we, Say that s of x is equal to 1, uh, s of x1 is equal to 1, s of x2 is equal to 1 as well, s of x, x is equal to 0, then beta over here will be equal to 0. Okay, so uh, it doesn't really matter how I, uh, what my function s will be doing because values of beta on our surface S will always be the following. So over here, beta will be equal to zero. Oh, it's not red. Oh, thank you. We have zero here, zero here, zero. 0, 1, and 0. Now, if I sum up, um, if we sum up values of beta on all triangles, we'll get 1, right? However, uh, just by the definition of uh, beta, what is happening is that I defined beta to be sum of uh, values assigned to edges, right? So now, just by the definition of beta, on the other hand, I should get zero. Right, it is just because every edge over here uh, is adjacent to exactly two triangles. So we get contradiction again. Okay, and now you might ask, so what is a big deal? Uh, you have just rewritten the equations over here. But uh, doing this uh, uh, operation allows us to actually start think about contextuality in a topological way. So let me give you the formalism behind all of this. Okay, so uh, we consider a set of observables Uh, which satisfies the following conditions. So firstly, um, we require that eigenvalues of uh, all observables in our set are in of the form, uh, I should write bigger omega k with 
k in zd and omega being this root of unity. So uh, just maybe one remark. So d is not varying here. We are fixing d at the very beginning. Okay. Secondly, if O belongs to O, then omega k times O belongs to O uh, for all k in Zd. Thirdly, if we have two commuting observables, then its product also belongs to O. And finally, we want identity to belong to O. OK, uh, any questions about these conditions? OK, uh, so this is our uh, set of consideration. And we will also choose a kind of indexing set to the subset TA indexed over some set E such that whole O is equal to uh, omega K times TA for all K, K in ZD and A in E. So uh, what is actually set E doing? What is this set doing? Right, we have, um, if we have a couple of observables which just differ, differ by uh, the constant omega k, we just choose one of them, okay? So for example, in, uh, in the Mermin square, uh, what is our set O? Well, our set O, is identity, x1, x2, uh, z1, z2, all of the variables uh, which I wrote here with the same variables with minus sign. And then the set E are just the variables, uh, just the observables which I wrote here. Okay? Um, yes. So now let uh, TA and TB uh, belong to O such that they commute. Then we can find an index C such that TC is equal to omega uh, to the power of, well, some constant depending on uh, A and B times TA, TB. So actually, we will write, instead of C, we'll write A plus B so that we get that TA plus B is equal to omega to the power of beta AB, TA, TB. Okay, and this omega over here will actually be uh, our uh, most important object which we are going to work with. Okay, so having a set um, O, actually, sorry, having the set E, as we discussed before, 
we may ask how we are building a surface like this. Okay, so let's think about it. So first point is just take a single vertex, which in our example is this guy over here. Remember that everything is glued, so this is just one vertex. Then for every A in E at an edge, okay, then what we are doing is A fill with a triangle every three edges TA, TB, and TA plus B. So, well, this is how this surface over here is built. Okay, so, so far I just gave you a kind of geometric description. Now, uh, what we are going to do is we are start to use topology or homological algebra. So a bit of homological algebra. Okay, so this was uh, my question at the beginning. Who of the students over here uh, is familiar with chain complexes and cochain complexes? A bit uh, and a bit, right? And over here, uh, are you? No, not at all. Okay. So, out of a given surface, Uh, we built a chain complex namely a sequence of ZD modules CN of N over zero connected by maps uh, dn that goes from cn to cn minus one such that uh, dn and uh, dn minus one followed by dn is equal to zero okay so how we usually think about it is we have a decreasing set of ZD modules. And what does it mean to be a, a T0? What does it mean to be a ZD module? Well, it is abelian group. And we have a well-defined uh, multiplication by ZD. Okay, uh, and these are connected by maps D. And the only thing which I require from these maps, a part of being uh, homomorphisms, is that if I go, if I start here, and then I will go two times by these maps, I will always keep zero. Okay, so in particular, what I get is that image of omega n, omega n is always a subset of the kernel of omega n minus one, right? So this is just saying that if I uh, go once by omega n, then I always hit the zero going the second time by omega n minus one. 
So in our case, how we are building a um, chain complex like this. So C0 is just ZD. C1 is a free module, a free ZD module on the set E, which means that uh, every element of C1 can be written in the form of linear combination. A in E, alpha A, A, alpha A in ZD. Now, uh, just a word, uh, here I put A in brackets uh, because we don't think necessarily about A here as an edge or any kind of, you know, um, object over here, but rather this is a symbol. Okay, formal symbol uh, corresponding to uh, the edge A. Uh, in particular, if I'm thinking about this geometrically, it doesn't really make sense for me to take a sum of this edge and this edge. What does it mean, right? And here I'm doing, um, I'm just defining it kind of formally. So I'm not summing edges, I'm summing symbols corresponding to edges. Then C2. Um, is uh, a free ZD module on the set A, B uh, in E cross E such that a and B commute. Right, so uh, in C2, what we have is, um, well, we have the same linear combinations, but now we are taking uh, linear combinations of symbols corresponding to the pair of pairs of commuting edges. And then C3, okay, maybe I'll write it here. Well, once again, is a free ZD module on the set. So quite similar to uh, the previous one, A, B, and C in E cross E cross E, such that, um, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I should put T here and T here. So by TA and TB, remember I mean the observables corresponding to uh, elements A and B. So here I have TA, TB is equal to TB, TC is equal to TA, TC which is all equal to zero. And I also need to give you the differentials. So the differentials are Uh, D1 of A is equal to 0, D2 of A, B is equal to uh, B plus A plus B, sorry, minus over here, plus A, and finally omega 3, D, sorry, D3 of A, B, C, is equal to B C minus A plus B C plus A B plus C minus 
A, B. Okay, I hope. No, so well. Yes, yes, it's just a notation. Well, because we started to use uh, this uh, notation over here, right? So this, well, this is a symbol corresponding to a pair AB. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm nearly done with this formalism. Yeah, so this uh, for uh, for us, uh, these are the only uh, one, two, three, four, uh, which are important. But you can see the pattern over here. Okay, so what would be C4? C4 would be, would be quadruples of edges such that corresponding um, corresponding observables commutes, pairwise commute, right? And then you can also see the pattern how the differential should go. No, I mean, what do you mean? C4, 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 C5, C5, no. Because what? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, C three is the only because uh, the beta will live in the uh, second cohomology. So we only care about the differential, uh, the second co-differential. Okay, so uh, this is how we define the chain complex. Uh, yes, as I said, uh, we define it only up to the uh, third group in the uh, chain complex, but actually we can um, continue with defining them, but it will not really matter uh, for us now. So any questions about this definition? Okay, so actually um, what we'll use is not a chain complex, but we'll use a cochain complex. So we further define the cochain complex C star uh, by taking or Cn by taking maps from Cn to Zb. Uh, maps, of course, I mean homomorphisms here. And okay, so, so far, these definitions are kind of algebraic, um, a little bit topological and stuff like this. But really what is happening is every um, group in my chain complex, well, I'm just thinking about edges in my surface. And I need a way somehow to add them formally and possibly multiply them by uh, elements of Zb. What is C2? Well, once again, I have a set of triangles over here and I need a way of uh, formally add them and multiply them by elements of Zd. The uh, interesting thing is that if I add the formal symbols uh, corresponding, for example, to this triangle and this triangle, well, actually, this is the same thing as a symbol corresponding to this triangle. Okay? And what is the cochain complex? Cochain complex is doing the following thing. I'm assigning, uh, so if the group C1 in the cochain complex is assigning to every edge some value in Zd. The group C2 in the cochain complex is assigning uh, some value from uh, Zd or Z2. Um, yeah, to every triangle I assign some value. And that's just it. So we also need a differential here. So D F, now I will write the uh, full thing on A1 up to AN is equal to F of 
uh, a2 up to a n minus f of a1 plus a2 up to a n and so on and so forth um, so important thing about the differential in the cochain complex is that actually d goes from d n goes from c n to c n plus one And finally, uh, we define the cohomology groups of the cochain complex as by the nth cohomology group of C upper star with coefficient z d is equal to the kernel of uh, d n divided by the image of d n minus one so uh, i secretly uh, okay so i didn't set this but the differential in the cochain complex behaves uh, exactly in the same way as in the chain complex. So if I go two times by differential, I always hit zero. Okay. So now we want to come back to beta and show that beta lives in the second cohomology group. Okay, so just a, a short recall how beta was defined. So we have this equation. Ta, Eb. Yes, so once again, A and B belongs to E. And the idea here is as follows that uh, how the set E, once again, was defined, I have the set, huge set of observables O, and then I'm choosing uh, one observable from every, um, yes, yeah, so I have subsets of observables which just differ by the uh, constant omega uh, to the power of k, so I'm choosing only one of them for every observable. Okay, so now if I multiply two observables of this kind, I will have exactly one third observable um, uh, in the set indexed by E, which differs from TA and TB by the constant. So in particular, uh, what we get is that beta uh, is a function from C2 to Zd. Well, uh, here we have Ta and Tb commute, right? So uh, C2, as before, C2 is a module on the set of edges such, such that their corresponding observables commute. So we actually want to show that beta lives in the uh, second cohomology group. And in order to show this, we need to show that it lives in the kernel. Then it will give us a class in the cohomology. That d2 of beta is equal to 0. So let's unravel this. Uh, d2 of beta 
on A, B, and C is equal to beta on uh, B, C minus beta on A plus B, C plus beta on A, B plus C minus beta on uh, AB. So, in other words, we want to show that beta on BC uh, plus beta on A, B plus C is equal to beta on A plus B, C plus beta on A and B. Okay, so how we are showing this? So, uh, what we need to look is uh, the following. So, if we have uh, three edges, A, B, and C, such that they pairwise commute, we have this element T, A plus B plus C. And we can write uh, this element in two ways, for example, like this. And by the definition of uh, the class beta and this element a plus b plus c this is equal to omega to the power of beta a plus b c times t a plus b times t c and further on this is equal to omega beta a plus b c now i can uh, using the definition once again i can unravel t times a plus b so this will be times omega beta a b times t a plus b plus c. On the other hand, what I can do is I can write it as follows. Uh, t a plus b plus c is equal to omega b a b plus c. Okay, and so on and so forth. I will I probably don't need to write all of this. What we'll get is that omega to the power of b a b plus c times omega a b c to the power of beta b c t a t b t c. So by comparing these two expressions, we get uh, the equality which we wanted. Right? So this is done, and therefore what we get is that beta is a valid element of the uh, second cohomology of our cochain complex. So now uh, the question is, okay, I defined some formalism, uh, but the question is what does it buy to us? So the question which I wanted to ask uh, before is, well, uh, I'm considering contextuality. So I'm looking, I'm trying to see if I'm giving you a set of observables, whether I can uh, give any kind of uh, hidden variable in a sense of the function, uh, uh, function S, which I described before. So uh, we want to have a function uh, from the set of our observables to ZD, which is kind of consistent. Okay, so in order to answer this question, I need to show one more observation. So uh, here I will call it observation, but in the original paper it is a lemma. So it is the following thing that assume that there exists
uh, consistent value assignment uh, s from e to zd then ds is equal to minus beta okay so what is happening here i define the function on my set of edges but i can extend it linearly to the map from c1 to zd right so this means that s gives me element of c1 in the cochain complex and now i can act by uh, on it by the differential by the map d and the claim is that the differential of s is minus beta beta which i defined before so proof is uh, the following that let the a p b be such that Um, PA commutes with PB. Then, uh, so how this value assignment works? Well, I'm assigning to TA some omega to the power S of A. To TB, I'm assigning uh, omega S of B. Right? And to TA, TB, I'm assigning omega to the power of SA plus SB. However, uh, by the definition of the TA plus B, I know that, on the other hand, this is equal to um, omega to the power of B, sorry, minus B, beta A, B, TA plus B. So to this guy, uh, what I'm assigning actually is omega minus beta a b times omega s a plus b. Right? So just from this equation, I get that omega to the power of s a plus s b is equal to omega to the power of minus beta a b omega s a plus b so what i get is that uh, s a plus s b minus s a plus b is equal to minus beta a b so if you take a look on the definitions this is exactly uh, how d is defined on the element a b Okay, so this is done and this gives us a connection. So now, here comes the main theorem of the paper, which we are. Yep. Uh, over here. Yeah. Yeah. This has to be Ah, here it should be B. Uh, no, this T is B T. Ah, yeah, right. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so the main uh, theorem of the paper, so I should probably give the name of the paper at the very end. Okay, but I already wrote it over there. Anyway, the uh, theorem is that given set of observables o if the second co uh, sorry if the class of beta in the yes let me write it like this if so I'm taking a look on the second cohomology group of the uh, corresponding cochain complex. And here I have class of beta. 
So if this class is different than zero, then O exhibits state independent contextuality. Yes, yes, and uh, okay. I gave you all of these complicated definitions, but these all amounts to what I've done over here, right? So we define the function b, and it is really a well-defined function on uh, our surface corresponding to the Mermin star, uh, Mermin square, and I. Uh, showed you that there is no such assignment as that I, I can in a consistent way assign uh, values to edges such, in such a way that sums of the values assigned to edges will give you will give me the uh, number which I put in the middle okay so maybe let us look on the uh, other example which is called the Mermin star. So this time we are taking a look on uh, three qubits, three qubits. Okay. Now the vertices are as follows x x x x y y y x y here we have y y x x one x three o oh, x two uh, Yes, yeah, sorry, I should distinguish y and x better. This is y, x, y. Yes. Okay, x3. So here I will have probably y1 and y2. Yes, and uh, here I have x, y, y. And here I have y3. So in the Mermin star, every edge uh, corresponds, well, edge of the star uh, corresponds to a context. Now, uh, yes, what is the surface corresponding to uh, the Mermin star? It is the following. Okay, x, 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 y, 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 x, y, 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 x. So here we have, okay x1, x2, x3, um, y2, and here we have y1, um, yes, x1, uh, ah, here this is the same surface, so this is the torus, y2, y3, and here we have x2. Now, yes, uh, how we are using our kind of topological framework to show that Mervyn star also uh, exhibits state independent contextuality? Well, in exactly the same way. So, over here, 
Um, yes, we have uh, this, this guy over here. So these four multiply to minus identity. So what we get is that our uh, assignment beta in Z2 will be the following. I have one over here, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So if I sum a beta over all faces in uh, this surface, I will get 1. But on the other hand, if I use the same argument that, okay, assume that there exists uh, um, uh, yeah, there exists a um, uh, value assignment. Then, if I sum the value assignment over the whole surface, I will get zero because every face is adjacent only to uh, sorry, every edge is adjacent only to two uh, faces. Okay, so uh, this is how um, proofs for state independent contextuality works. So I think uh, we have still half an hour. Okay, do you have any questions about this? Okay. So I think I will discuss also state-dependent um, contextuality. Okay, once again, now uh, our main example will be Mervin star rather than Mervin square. And this is just because in the Mervin star, we have um, the set of observables. which actually I labeled by red. And the uh, special state oh, so which is denoted G, H, Z for the surnames of uh, three people. Uh, actually, I don't remember the surnames. Anybody? Okay. So this is called GHZ state, uh, which is equal to 0, 0, 0 plus um, 1, 1, 1 divided by square root of 2. Sorry? Sorry, I can. Uh, square of two, I think. Yes, and the surnames are Greenberger, Horner, Zeilinger. Okay. Um, this state has the property that for every uh, the state GHZ is um, an eigenvalue of uh, all observables in Uh, of all red observables. Well, okay. And uh, what are the corresponding eigenvalues? Uh, okay, uh, here the, I'm not really uh, being correct because the eigenvalues are either minus one or one. 
but uh, how we are thinking here is that the value corresponding to a given eigenvalue is minus 1 to the power of our uh, given value. So this will be 1, 0, 0, and 0. Okay, and now the question is, can we extend? Um, yep. Uh, zero, one, so the one is on the bottom. Uh, so x zero means eigenvalue one, right? Yes. So x x x x cross is eigenvalue. So you are saying that. Okay, and one should be. Sorry? Ah, sorry, this is one, one, zero. Okay, right. Uh, the question is can we extend uh, this value assignment to the whole set? Whole E. So, okay, uh, we, this is kind of reversing the question and we already know that the answer is no. But uh, here we are starting, uh, as I understand, from different points. So we don't have the state independent case. We just know that there is uh, some starting uh, value assignment depending on the state GHZ. And the question is whether we can, for this state, extend this um, value assignment. Yep. I don't know if this is a really interesting question. Why don't you compare y, y, y over t? So we have each of the Yeah, so once you have a y, y, y. Uh, yeah, so the, the extent state is a stabilized by, I mean, that's an eigenstate of the zero four. <laughs> How do you do the third one? Okay. So now, uh, to answer this, let us extend a bit our formalism. So we have this uh, chain complex and cochain complex assigned to this uh, surface, right? Uh, actually, maybe the only thing is that we defined, uh, we wanted to have triangles uh, in our surface, so let us divide these guys into triangles. Yep. Um, okay, I will not label them uh, triangles, but this is how the picture looks like. Okay, uh, however, we can um, kind of define a, a certain subcomplex uh, corresponding to uh, GHZ or any kind of eigenstate. So, to this end, Uh, define the set of observables O psi and O for a state. So here I'm coming back to the general uh, case for a state psi uh, such that O psi is equal to all of the observables in O such that O times psi is equal to omega to some SO times psi for some SO in ZD. In other words, uh, 
the set O psi are all observables for which the state psi is an eigenstate. Okay, so note that if O1 and O2 are in O psi and um, they commute, then uh, O1 or times O2 also belongs to O times O psi. Okay, so thus uh, what we get, uh, so this of course descends to edges, and then what we get is that we can define a subcomplex C star on E psi. So, um, what exactly is this uh, subcomplex? I'm using the same definition which I gave you before, but now my set of edges is smaller. Uh, the edges uh, which are in my subset E psi are the edges such that the state psi is their eigenvalue, right? And then I can uh, do the same definition for the C2, C3, C4, and so on and so forth. So in our case, in our um, Mermin star, we have this whole uh, surface which gives us a complex. And the complex E, G, H, Z in this case will be built by these four edges. Okay? So further on, uh, let us define... as psi um, from e psi to zd uh, in such a way such that pa on psi is equal to omega to s psi on a times psi. Okay, so this is just uh, for all A in E psi. So this, is, uh, this definition is just saying that I'm starting my value assignment from the eigenvalues of, uh, God bless you, observables in uh, the set E psi corresponding to the, this eigenstate. So, uh, in order to achieve my goal uh, in answering the question is, can we extend this as psi to the whole uh, value assignment on the whole surface? Um, what we are doing is we want to extend uh, as psi to the function S from E to ZD satisfying SA plus SB minus SA plus B is equal to minus beta AB uh, for all commuting. which are not in E psi cross E psi and T A T B commutes and coincide and coinciding with S psi on E psi. Okay, so uh, we can see that 
to answer our question, the edges which are in Ipsi are kind of irrelevant. We know what is happening here. The question is whether we can, um, yes, and we have information uh, contained in beta. So the question is whether we can extend uh, this S Psi to the whole S. So, uh, define the following uh, complex. So C star of uh, E, E Psi, is defined as the complex C star of E divided by its subcomplex E Psi. So what does it mean is that we are uh, from our complex, we are throwing out edges which are in Ipsi. So in particular, we can write um, elements of C1 E Ipsi are of the form are uh, linear combinations. So again, I have this sum uh, over A. But this time, this will be E without E psi uh, alpha A times E uh, times A with alpha A belonging to ZB. Okay? And uh, this gives me also a valid chain complex in the sense that uh, I can uh, uh, kind of define the differential. I can take the differential which I had on uh, the complex uh, C star E and use it also in uh, my relative complex. And this is called relative differential. Yep. Okay, so um, maybe let me use my example over here. So how the surface will look like after um, contracting edges uh, belonging to my set E psi. So E psi is the square over here. So the only thing which I will get is this thing. So I have x2, x1, x3. y2, y1, uh, y3, x2, and y2 over here. So now we define um, beta psi to be beta plus the differential of s psi. So now how I think about s uh, psi, I think of it as well defined on the set E psi and extended by zeros everywhere, right? Okay, so in particular in my example over here, the B psi will be the following thing. We have the following values. Um, let me just check it, yep. So I have one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, and now using the same idea of summing up over all this, over the whole surface, what I will get is that the B psi summed over the whole surface is equal to one, but if I sum the edges, I will get zero. So once again, I get state dependent contextuality. And this is the uh, final theorem is that if B psi is non-zero in the second cohomology of C, E, E psi, 
coefficient in Zd, then the pair uh, uh, O psi exhibits state dependent. contextuality. Okay, so uh, I briefly went uh, through them, um, through the state dependent contextuality and this is uh, a part of the cohomological framework for, for MBQC. And uh, yes, two last things uh, I would like to say is that uh, the third part of the paper uh, concerns uh, symmetry-based proofs of the uh, contextuality. So now what is happening here is that we... Well, in these proofs what we are comparing is just uh, class beta and sum of all edges. However, in the uh, symmetry-based proofs, I am allowed to perform some symmetry. So these sets are coming with um, symmetries, right? Which may or may not change uh, my value assignment. And if I compare the value assignment after and before the uh, applying uh, of the symmetry, I might get a contradiction. So this gets us uh, to the uh, realm of group cohomology. So just one level higher. Uh, yes, so this is the third part of the paper, and the paper uh, actually on which we are basing over here is this one, Topological Proofs of Contextuality in Quantum Mechanics, and authors are Okai, Roberts, Bartlett, and Rausendorf. Okay, and I think I will stop here. Thank you. So, any questions? Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I, I need to refer you to the authority here. Uh, uh, yeah, so what's the question? Uh, I mean, I'm Are we stopping?